This Sunday on Capital Connection, federal prosecutors indict Mike Madigan. U.S. attorneys accuse Madigan of using his power to amass $2.8 million in wealth for himself and his allies. How Democrats are responding. I'm standing here because people stood on courage and made a decision to go in a new direction. We knew that our chamber, our state, and our party deserved better leadership. We have a new speaker in the Illinois House. And how Republicans are attacking. Today may be the darkest day in Illinois government history. This indictment is the most sweeping public corruption charge in case to hit Illinois in decades. Let me just tell the public this. Next November, the citizens of our state will have a real option. Next, they'll have a real option to change the course of our state. Plus, the push for ethics, why some felons can still run for office in Illinois, and how that might change. It's all coming up on Capital Connection. From the Illinois State Capitol Rotunda, Capitol Bureau Chief Mark Maxwell is asking the tough questions. This is Capital Connection. Welcome to Capital Connection. I'm Mark Maxwell reporting from the Illinois State House on this Sunday, March 6. On Wednesday, the feds dropped the hammer on the Velvet Hammer. The man whose nickname turned into public official A was now named in that federal indictment that brought 22 criminal counts. Former Speaker Michael Madigan claiming his innocence, but will now have to do that in court. Today, a federal grand jury returned a 22 count indictment charging former Illinois House Speaker Michael Madigan. U.S. Attorney John Lausch filed this indictment in federal court Wednesday titled United States of America versus Michael J. Madigan. We have a very stubborn public corruption problem here in Illinois. The indictment rehashes old details about a corrupt scheme for ComEd to pad the pockets of Madigan's political allies while the speaker wielded his power to pad their bottom line. The indictment accuses Madigan of leading for nearly a decade a criminal enterprise whose purpose was to enhance Madigan's political power and financial well-being while also generating income for his political allies and associates. Plus, new accusations Madigan, quote, devised a scheme to defraud the people of Illinois in a Chinatown land deal. And this quote from 2017, where Madigan told former Chicago Alderman Danny Solis to reel in a client for his law firm in a quid pro quo. We follow the evidence where it leads. Sometimes we get there more quickly than we think. Other times it takes us longer. Solis wore a wiretap for the feds when Madigan said he'd verbally tell then-Governor-elect J.B. Pritzker to appoint Solis to a state board. I have kept my distance. But Pritzker's office says he has no memory of Madigan ever following through, and Pritzker never appointed Solis to a state job. There is no allegation in this indictment, um, you know, against the governor or his staff. We have got to root out these people in public office if they have committed acts of corruption. House Republicans pounced at the news in this election year. Not just an indictment against Michael Madigan, but it's an indictment against the Democrat Party of Illinois that he ran for decades. While the new House Speaker credited Democrats for removing Madigan. I'm standing here because people stood on courage and made a decision to go in a new direction. The process played out, the process worked. There's a new Speaker here. Former Speaker will have his day in court. Joining us now is House Democrat Stephanie Kifowit. Thank you for joining us. You were the first Democrat to run and oppose Mike Madigan when that was not a sure bet. If we go back in time, more than a year and a few months ago, a lot of people thought that might be a foolhardy notion. You didn't have enough votes to actually defeat him at the time. Take us back there. Oh, correct. It was um, a little bit stressful and uh, October 1st was when I announced and we plan to announce it uh, without any notice because of fear of retribution or sabotage of the announcement before if any of the no uh, any of the news went out you that were I was announcing. That the we speaker were or his allies would tank your rollout. Right. We were very concerned with that. And so that's why uh, the press went out at 7 a.m. The announcement was made at 10 a.m. the same day. Do you think we would be standing here? Do you think that former Speaker Madigan would be former Speaker Madigan if you had not come out and opposed his candidacy for Speaker? I think on October 1st, I got the ball rolling and got the conversation going. And I think a, a lot of individuals started thinking about a future without Mike Madigan and realized that this was the right direction to go because just the public trust was continually being undermined. And we really need to take a stand. Was there anything in that indictment that was news to you? 
I, I don't think so. I, I skimmed it. I'm not a lawyer, but it it it, it all kind of played out. And, and I've always said that people that portray themselves as above the law wind up getting in trouble with the law. And I thought, as we're seeing, that that is holding true. The speaker is not here, obviously, the former speaker, uh, but through his lawyers, his criminal defense attorney and his own personal lawyer, they're both saying he's going to beat these charges. He's innocent and he never crossed any lines that actually broke the law. That aside, the speaker was known as someone who was very crafty and very careful. As paranoid as he was about losing one inch of power, he was also that paranoid about inviting federal indictment, right? He was always walking that line. So he'll say things like offering a job to someone wasn't illegal. To that, you would say? Well, I believe that the lawyers and the law will work itself out and, and that that but would work out think before he, a judge. Do I, you think he broke the law? I think he acted borderline unethically, and I do believe that we are held to a higher standard, and he did not live within those standards that he should have. I'm not a lawyer, so I can't really comment on the legalities of law, but I think that as an elected official, we have to hold ourselves, and especially, especially somebody who's holding the Speaker of the House, to an extremely high level. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a difficult place to be in at this moment. Of course, he's under 22 counts of federal mm -hmm. indictment for racketeering, for bribery, for using his position to intimidate and threaten companies in, in getting that, those rewards back to enrich his allies, or in some cases himself, through his own personal law firm. But the actual allegations in the indictment itself are repackaged from the ComEd corruption scandal. From right. These are things that the feds have had in their records for years. It's possible that they know a lot more that isn't spelled out in that indictment just yet. Oh, I think there's a lot more. <laughs> Why do you say that? I, I just believe that in the, the role of our judicial system, and, and I think the federal government is very thorough when they do bring charges together, and, and I, I personally just believe that there, there's more to the surface um, that might, might come out, might not come out, but I... There are, it's been reported that there are some of your colleagues who have testified before a grand jury. I, I, I think more will come out. That's, uh, that's my belief. What do you make about Governor Pritzker's involvement in this indictment? The, the, the prosecutor said he's not being charged, he's not being accused of any wrongdoing, but Madigan mentioned Pritzker's name in a conversation with former Alderman Danny Solis. He said, I'll go to the future governor, I'll put in a good word for you, I'll get you appointed to a state job. Now, that appointment never transpired. Pritzker says he has no recollection of Madigan ever making that ask. So. If there was a quid, there wasn't a quo <laughs> there, but the governor just being named in the indictment does bring him under the specter of scrutiny, does it not? Well, I think, I think you have to look at the role, and he was a witness, and um, he was mentioned in the wiretapping, and, and, you know, Madigan told people sometimes things they wanted to hear, and um, I was told things when I would bring concerns that he would address things, and then down the line it wouldn't happen, so I think that we have to keep that with a nugget of that who we're talking about is somebody, like you said, wants to manage things, wants to manipulate things, wants to have things under his control, and you do that by maybe telling one thing to one person and another thing to another person, or just conveniently forgetting to bring it up as well. So, so just because Madigan said it doesn't mean it was true. I don't believe that. Yes, I believe, uh, correct, what you just said. Just because Madigan said it, I, I don't believe it's true, and, and there's no corroborating evidence. And, uh, that, that, that was also news. I think that was one of the pieces of news that was not spelled out in the indictment, but we quickly learned it after. It was that Governor Pritzker's office said he was pleased to cooperate as a government witness to sit down and answer the questions from the FBI. That He says he answered all of them. I understand that to mean he didn't, you know, back off or say, I don't recall. Maybe that is an answer. I, but, well, in, in one case, he said, I don't recall that conversation with Madigan. Um, but uh, don't you think Republicans are going to use that and say, look, the governor himself is testifying witness as a witness before the FBI in this big corruption uh, scheme and couldn't that be uh, something that pops up in a campaign ad that might tarnish the Democratic image? Well, I think the Democratic image is that um, Democrats stood up and Mike Madigan is no longer in office. That's a fact. But I think the other thing is, is I think everybody's civic duty is to, if you, uh, unfortunately, if you do get a call from somebody in investigation, uh, going all the way back to Blagojevich and, um, you know, Edward Hospital, if you do get that call, I think it's your duty to, to work with those investigators. So I don't think there's anything wrong with the governor doing his civic duty, working with uh, the FBI and answering their questions. That's part of our judicial system. Yeah.
It, it's certainly interesting to see. But what, what do you think took Democrats so long to stand up to Madigan? Well, uh, myself as a representative was relatively new. Uh, I'd only been there eight years, and I would argue to say the first couple of years you're trying to learn things. It's, it's a very uh, overpowering system to try to learn. And I think as time goes by, you realize that some things aren't right and you can't quite put your finger on it. And, and for me, I think the indictment was just the straw that broke the camel's back. No more. This is not right. It's not uh, the will of the people. It's not good for the people. And we need to take a stand. And so very early on, it was myself, along with eight other individuals that were uh, opposed to Madigan. We were singled out. Uh, we were marginalized. He was presumed to be the speaker, like you said. When I announced on October 8th, it was still those few people, and uh, I was alone at the podium, and um, it's got the ball rolling. And as time went on, I think that more and more representatives realized that this isn't our party, this isn't what we stand for, and, and we can no longer stand for it. And so then at that day, it, it um, rolled into 19 individuals, myself included, and when the final vote came, 22 individuals did not vote to retain Speaker Madigan. It's very interesting. Uh, you ran for Speaker. Your colleagues elected someone else. Correct. How do you feel Speaker Welch is doing? I think Speaker Welch is doing a, a very good job. I think that we've passed a lot of great legislation. He has an open door policy. Uh, but I think the number one thing that differentiates himself from Speaker Madigan is when I would go, my personal experience, go talk to Speaker Madigan, it was not received at all. It was, it was almost like an obligatory meeting. He was obliged to listen to me but not hear me out, not acknowledge the concerns or anything like that. A lot of lip service I got from Speaker Madigan. Um, what I have from Speaker Welch is, is a true concern and a, a willingness to work together collaboratively as a team instead of just giving lip service. Uh, I think he really does take the position of Speaker to heart and working with us. Very interesting. Uh, we're heading into campaign season. Uh, you're running again. Yes. And what do you make of this idea that the suburbs are the political battleground You've got Richard Irvin running from not far from your neck of the woods there. Uh, I, I served with Richard Irvin on the city council. You did? I did. Okay. Do you have any, <laughs> so any? I'm, I'm, I, I know Richard Irvin. <laughs> uh, and is he a Democrat? No, he's always been a Republican. Okay. He, that's he wrote that's a, a question letter, in, in Republican he, he Party He wrote a circles. letter supporting my, my Republican opponent uh, the last time I was contested for state representative. There you have it. Very interesting. Uh, but. Are Democrats vulnerable in the suburbs right now with inflation creeping up, shooting up, really, with crime rising nationwide? You're seeing Richard Irvin and other Republicans campaign themes, and you're hearing their strategists saying, we've got to get to voters in the suburbs. Are you, are you bracing for a bit of a political bloodbath, so to speak, in the, in the suburbs this, uh, this election year? Or do you think Democrats can hold their ground? I think Democrats are going to hold their ground. Uh, we, I mean, just recently the governor announced $250,000 in crime prevention funding uh, in order to address crime. A and quarter so, million dollars? Mm-hmm. $250 million. $250 million. Okay. $250 million. I misheard yeah. you. No, I'm sorry. Uh, $250 million to address crime and crime statistics. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, crime is a very multifaceted problem. And so I, I understand that Republicans want to use a simple solution for a complex problem. But I think Democrats will stand their own and will really show that we're working really hard in the communities and working really hard for our constituents. It will be interesting. There's always that political pendulum that swings. And right now, Democrats are in power in the House, the Senate, the governor's office in Springfield, the House, the Senate, and the White House on Capitol Hill. So there's really nowhere to go but down. Or, or do you think Democrats can grow their gains? Well, I think that we're competitive, and I think that, that there is a possibility of us growing representation in the Illinois House. And I can't speak for the, the other national level, but I do think that uh, the Democrats in the House, under the leadership of Speaker Welch, have done a lot of good things and working really hard with our community. Is that your expectation for Speaker Welch? Is that how you will define or measure his success as a campaigner? No, if you I don't gain seats, is that on him? Well, I think that we, we have the potential to gain seats, and I believe that what we have done in the House has set the foundation to gain seats in, in the next election. Uh, we passed a, a truly balanced budget. Moody's and, and other credit agents gave us an upgrade, the first upgrade in 20 years. That's a historic uh, accomplishment that I 
truly in my heart of heart believe would not happen if Mike Madigan was speaker. That's very interesting. That was one of the things uh, Representative Kelly Cassidy mentioned in a press conference recently when they said, don't you think this is going to be bad for Democrats, this specter of indictment against the former speaker? And she said, imagine how bad it would be if he were still there, if he was being indicted, dragged out of office in cuffs while he was speaker. Oh, I think that that would be horrific. And I think that we realize that that's just not going to happen. So that's why we have a new speaker here going forward, going forward with a comprehensive environmental legislation that I don't think would have happened under Speaker Madigan. There's a lot of things that are moving forward that I don't think would have ever moved forward under Speaker Madigan. But that's a good place to leave it. Let's ask this. I think a lot of people, so a lot of Republicans, especially downstate, they sort of just associate Mike Madigan with Democratic politics and they just sort of say, okay, that guy was a huge liberal. On the scale of you know far left to far right in all of the political spectrum of where would you put Mike Madigan on that scale? Uh, I would put Mike Madigan as an opportunist obstructionist. When it was an opportune moment, he would obstruct. When it was an opportune moment, it wouldn't obstruct. It really didn't have to do with any political so he was ideologies. Fluid politically. Yes. The 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 business folks thought he was a. They they described him once as a moderating force against more progressive liberal tendencies. I think he was just an opportunist. So he didn't have an allegiance. <laughs> I don't to think a he had allegiance, he had allegiance anywhere. Allegiance to power. Anywhere, no. Very interesting. Interesting yes. perspective. Representative Stephanie Kippowit, thank you for joining us. When we come back, one of the former House Republicans who sat on that special investigative committee looking into the ComEd corruption case and possibly trying to expel Speaker Madigan, that never came to fruition. How does he view this indictment through that lens? Grant Worley joins us next.